That's where I think the Iraq war has failed miserably, is that democracy is not just about elections, it's about institutions, yeah. it's about civil liberties, it's about all of these uh, good education, good infrastructure. That was not, I mean, and that was not built, even though some may argue that was the intention of the war, but as you dig in more and you see the corruption between the contractors and the other contractors and suddenly just the money disappears for some reason, which was yeah. all meant for kind of rebuilding institutions. I'm Dave Rubin and this is The Rubin Report. Quick note everybody, we've changed up our publishing schedule. So going forward, clips are going up throughout the week and our full interviews will be right here on YouTube on Sundays. And of course, click that subscribe button and turn on notifications, blah, blah, blah. And more importantly, joining me today is the founder of Ideas Beyond Borders, a brand new American citizen, Faisal Al-Mutar. Welcome back to The Rubin Report. Hello, Dave, how are you? Good, I find, thank you for asking, yeah. I dropped the Saeed there. I said Faisal Al-Mutar. Do you go by Faisal Saeed Al-Mutar? I go, yeah. Faisal Al-Mutar. Actually, good buddy I, I, of mine, I, I'm actually not sure. I go with Faisal Saeed for a reason. I mean, Saeed is my dad's name. Yeah. And the reason I kept it is because I have a very strong relationship with my dad and the reason why he raised me to be the person that I am. I mean, some people keep the dad's name away, but I kept my dad's name and actually my first name so I can maintain my relationship with him. All right, then I feel I should look at you and do that intro again. Welcome to the show, Faisal Saeed Al-Mutar. Thanks, Dave, thank you. I am very excited to have you here, my friend, because as of right now, you are now a five-time Rubin Report guest. I believe that puts you in the Jordan Peterson, Ben Shapiro category. Wow, and I'm-, I'm And all, you. Oh, that's- A, a recent <laughs> immigrant to the United States, can I, you believe I, it? I think I've made it, that's it, <laughs> I, I'm, I'm out of this country. Um, actually, what I, what I just I was just noticed is that you really notice all my developments since I came to the States. You actually, like, if, if people, if your audience watched the previous episodes to now, they will see, like, pretty much my, I think you interviewed me one year after my get my green card. Mm -hmm. And so this was around probably... 2014, I think? 2014, 20, 2015? No, it was 2015, probably yeah. the fall of 2015. And yeah, that was one year after I got my green card, which is in 2014. Mm -hmm. I landed in Los Angeles in 2013. Uh, and then, yeah, and then here I am. Uh, yeah, that was like, it's some kind of uh, mind boggling. Yeah, well, we'll have a playlist of just the interviews that I've done with you. And it is an interesting evolution. And we're gonna talk a little yeah, bit yeah, about yeah. your story and all that. Um, but it's funny because uh, when you were on the way this morning and I was thinking about what I wanted to talk about and ideas beyond borders and everything else that you're doing, you feel to me like an old friend. But it's funny because we only know each other for four or five years, and a, and a lot of what we know about each other is public, although I've you know, been out to dinner yeah, and all that yeah. stuff many times. But it shows you how fast things are changing because it does feel, this feels like an old friendship to me. I, I mean, I Which mean, is weird because I, I mean, it's not like we've known each other for 30 years. I mean, five years is, is uh, one fifth of my age. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, yeah, I've, I've known you, yeah, I've known you since, yeah. Since I came to the United States, almost, yeah. Yeah, all right, and, so and, let's... And, and I hope the friendship continues, that's... Well, let's just see that. Yeah, let's, let's, let's see about tonight, yeah. Yeah, okay, so, first off, you are a brand new American citizen, and yes. I wanna talk about that. Probably you, so, You've yeah. got the leather jacket to match, <laughs> you are loving America right yeah. now. Um, but for people who don't know who you yeah. are, because obviously the show has grown a lot since way back when, I know, can we yeah. talk a little bit about your story in Iraq, growing up in Iraq, and the war, and everything else? Yeah, yeah. Let's do a quick recap on that. Well, I mean, uh, I was born in Babylon, Babylon, Iraq, and then my what, dad- What year? That was 1991. Okay. So right after the first Gulf War and under the sanctions. God, you're a young kid. Um, well, when you hear the story, you'll see <laughs> that, I'm, that I'm more more mature than average. But, and so I, I was born in 1991, and then my parents moved to Baghdad as I, as I was uh, seven or eight years old. And my dad is an orthopedic surgeon, my mom is a lawyer, so I come from, both, my dad studied in the, in, in the UK, and came back to the country to fix Iraq, but then Saddam Hussein went to the Gulf War and then the country went downhill. So- Were you born during the Gulf War, actually? No, after. The, so yeah. the Gulf War was, was 90? 1990, 1990 and, then, yeah. and then, so I, and then that, after that, the, they, they, and from the Iraq side, we declared that the, one, the war has won, <laughs> right, and right. it's called the mother of all battles. Yeah. And uh, so that happened, and then as I was growing up, I grew up under Saddam Hussein, and I mean, one of the main anecdotes that I, that I is actually very relevant to what I'm saying is that I didn't know that Iraq invaded Kuwait. 
the, the, the way that it was manufactured by both the state, and then there was a mosque next to our house called the Mother of All Battles, where the Manara is designed as a ballistic missile in AK-47. Wow. So Saddam Hussein started building mosques all over the country. With, with missiles, basically, yeah, yeah, as, as, as a, the uh, ornament at the top yes. of the mosque. Yes, and so, so that was like, and declared Iraq to be kind of an Islamic state, uh, which brings us to the future, but he's the one who put God is great on the flag. So the environment I was growing up in, even though the misconception generally is like Saddam used to be secular and all of that, I grew up in an era called the Faith Campaign, in which Saddam actually, Saddam Hussein moved Iraq to become more a religious state. So, so before you were born though, so when your parents were younger, yeah, yeah. it was more of a secular, or Saddam was more secular yes. than, than after the war. Relatively, yeah, and, and it was more Arab nationalist. So, so Arab nationalism was kind of the phase that first Saddam moved in, it was in a war with Iran, and we had to differentiate ourselves as the Arabs versus the Persians and Iranians, all of that. So actually the battle is called Qadisiyah, which is also relevant to the battle. So anyway, so 2003 happened, so that's where the Iraq war. Um, so the area that I used to live in was an area in which many of Saddam generals used to live in. So as the war happened and Iraqi military was defeated, obviously, many of these generals started leaving the district and the houses became all empty. So from suddenly a, f a, a full residential area with a lot of people, suddenly it was like many of the houses were on the highway Totally all empty. Meaning they were going to fight or they were fleeing? No, they were fleeing the country. Many yeah. of them either went to Jordan or some other Arab state. Some of them went to different provinces. We don't know, honestly, but, but I know that they left. And so after these houses became empty and then now suddenly chaos started erupting in the country, these houses start being taken over by Al-Qaeda. So from normal families into now militias walking the streets, so they so, used. So what, what was that really like? So now you're in your yeah, community where um, you live, and suddenly, okay, now there's abandoned houses. Yeah. You don't know where these people went. They yeah. were part of the army, and now Al Qaeda shows up. I mean, what what is that actually like? So so what is like is what you what I think many people have seen in in videos of 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 when these militias take over. The usual the usual day was there is an IED. So an IED is an explosive device that they put in the streets. So when there is a U.S. Humvee comes in, or eventually Iraqi army starts coming up, blow up, and then kill some soldiers, and then there's a fight back and all of that. So that's, God, this is the usual day. That's, that's what people do on the weekend. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and if, I mean, from my end, I mean, I've seen, I mean, I've seen it all, uh, from people uh, firing rockets at U.S. tanks, to um, beheadings, to dead people on the street. Uh, so that was my, my that's why, that was my high school era. So yeah. there were times. So you're seeing which, that at, at like basically um, like 14 years old, 15 yeah, years yeah, old, yeah. something like that. Like, I mean, what does that do to a 14 year old's mind? Like, what did you think was happening? I will talk about that actually after moving to a safer area and kind of getting that. Uh, actually, maybe, maybe I can say it now. Is I just a year ago I uh, was just uh, sitting in my patio, my friend's patio, and it just came into me as like, wow, I've been safe for a while. Like hmm. this is. This normal life looks cool. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> this kind of, because the usual day is, I mean, I mean, my mom was obviously tortured as well, is that she never know whether her kid is gonna come back to, to house. So, so yes, like I, I've, I've had this realization actually kind of recently is like, I've, this, this normal life, which is like not to worry about bombings and, 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 and suicide attacks and all of that, at the time was my normal. That was actually, uh, and, after a while, somebody gets desensitized, honestly. I mean, after you constantly start seeing it, and the whole environment is like that. It's like, yeah, you talk to a friend, he's like, oh, I just, my brother got killed. I'm like, oh, okay, you wanna grab lunch? Yeah. Seriously, this yeah. is actually the, yeah. uh, the mood of the day. And so, so that was, in a way, these were like the first two years were the good years. So even though there were IEDs and, and some suicide bombers, they were the good days. And then there was a major day happened in Iraq in which Al-Qaeda blew up one of the largest Shia mosques in the country. It's called Imam al-Askari, which is an area in northern Baghdad. And as a result, now the Shia militias start popping up. And my neighborhood, luckily, was just in the middle between these two. So they start firing rockets at each other. So, and that rocket can, I mean, most, most of these people are inexperienced, so the rocket can hit a school, it can hit a house, it can, so again, the usual day is, Oh, somebody's house was blown up. Can, okay. can you quickly explain the, um, the, the, the Sunni-Shia split there? Because I think somebody might hear, oh, uh, Al-Qaeda blew up a, a Sunni mosque. Shia mosque, yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and not understand why they, that, they would do that. 
Well, I mean, I mean the history is long, but in, in, at least in the modern context, um, as Iraq, so Saddam Hussein used to be Sunni, um, which is relevant in this conversation. So after, so many of the generals and, and the military used to be from the Sunni, um, at least the leadership, where most of them were Sunnis. So that created, and they are the minority in Iraq. They, are, they, they represent, and so obviously some of them were dissident against Saddam Hussein, but, but generally speaking, the perception is that Sunnis were the ones controlling. After that, the, then the Iraqs are getting divided into militia. So the Iraqi civil identity start being destroyed. So mm -hmm. most people start went back to their religion and their sect, mainly their sect. And the Shia militias, I mean, the main funder of that, I mean, funding is pretty much very relevant here. Funding of the Shia militias come from Iran. And the funding from the Sunni militias come from Qatar and Saudi Arabia and the Gulf states. Mm -hmm. And they have a different, uh, in a way, it's a power struggle who actually controls the country and what vision they have to, uh, the, the concept within the, Sunni, the, within the Sunni militias is the concept of the caliphate, which is the, the, the ISIS's and Al-Qaeda's, and within the Shias is the called Wilayat al-Faqih, which is the, that the Shias have a version which is kind of similar to Christianity in a way that there was a 12th Imam who was hidden, and the Khomeini, and, and Ayatollah Khamenei now in, in Iran, is kind of the representative of that human on earth until he comes back. So in a way, they're both theocratic authoritarian, but they have a different vision of what theocratic authoritarianism looks like in yeah. practice. And, and, and where the funding goes, which I want to talk a little bit more later, yeah, especially yeah. related to Qatar, is really interesting. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah and, and the yeah, funding, so I've, I've written a, a, an article when I was in Iraq and later on that I translated, which is that it's, it's easier to start a terrorist group in the Middle East than to start a liberal one. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> and, sure. and, and many of the reasons is that I mean, I've, I've seen funding going like in front of me. Like I've been to a restaurant and a guy came in with a bag of cash, giving it to somebody, and he's like, "Oh, go fight with the mujahideen and, and all of that." So, so see, like there was, was some of the funding was really public. It was not really like hidden. Um, so yeah, so so that happened, and then suddenly Iraq erupted to a much more sectarian civil war. At the beginning, it was we, we used to lose maybe. 5,000 a month, or now it became reached some months reached to 25,000 or 30,000. And that's where I lost my brother and my, my cousin. Uh, that was the peak, peak of 2007. That was when, when things were um, erupting. And w my crazy me at the time were like, oh, why don't everybody get along hmm. attitude? And, and I was with my friends and, and so, uh, who were more on the liberal liberal side. So you you were like starting atheist groups at that time, right? Not atheist, but but mostly like secular anti author, anti, -theoc anti theocracy. I mean, we, we had like some people who were religious with us who were also antagonistic or so a different version of Islam or necessarily believe in it that much. So yes, it was kind of more inclusive than, than just non-believers. Wh so, what was that like though, to be starting a group or just be around people that were doing something that's pretty subversive yeah. relative to what's happening? I, I mean, first it started online. First is, is that's really how we find ourselves. It's online, when, when Saddam was in power, we didn't have, we hardly all had two-state television and barely no internet. It used to call it intranet, which is only local uh, internet. And then when the internet shows up, which is, which is after the, the, the war, then everything was opened up. So the Iraq, Iraq, at the time, the internet was as open as this here in the United States. You can access every website and everything. And at the time, there, were, there was a website called Blogspot, which is kind of part of, of Google, Googlebot. And then there were other like, forums. And, and that's what I started. And then after a while, like, OK, where do you live? Are you in Baghdad? Are you here? And then most, many times, people don't reveal their identity for mm -hmm. obvious reasons. Mm -hmm. and, but I was able to. With also from some of my friends there, we're able to, to formulate groups in which we meet up and discuss things. Unfortunately, after a while, that started becoming a target. Uh, so we, st we went back to hiding. And I, after the loss of my brother and my cousin and, and getting multiple death threats, I left the country. So I left, I left Iraq in 2009. I left it to Lebanon. So that's the second phase of my life in which post Iraq, which I left. I, I remember the day I left Iraq. It was 9 9 September 2009. Hmm. So September 9th, 2009. Um, and so Iraq at the time was still in its war zone. There was not, not, nothing 
much uh, happening. And I know I've asked you this before, but can you just talk a little bit? How how did you get over the border and all that? So so I not, didn't have a quarrel with the Iraqi government. So actually, I left through the usual airport. The Iraqi it used to be called Saddam International Airport. It became eventually Baghdad International Airport. So so I was okay to leave the country from the state because the state didn't have any. Even though the state was sectarian, but I mean I'm the last of their worries. I wasn't really uh, targets, but. My neighborhood, my, the whole part of West Baghdad, where I come from, there were, there were parts, for example, called Shar al Afghan, which means Afghan Street. So these are all Afghans came from Afghanistan who came and fought in Iraq against, against either US military or the Iraq government. There were like Chechnyans, and there were a lot of people from all these. Di so we became like the Times Square of terrorism. <laughs> <laughs> so whatever you think of whatever nation that had foreign fighters, they all came. And, and some of them actually came before the war. I mean, when the war, when, when the war ended, I remember I saw my first American, which was an Abrams tank coming in front of my house. And that was in April uh, 2003. And, and how did you feel then? Because this is where you have an interesting perspective I yeah, think, on, on um, American foreign policy relative to all this. So you see the tank going by. Yeah, what, what are you thinking? It's, I mean, first, it's, it's obviously scary. Uh, but at the same time, it was a feeling of relief. I mean, the, the life of the last years of Saddam Hussein were because he knew at the time he was going to lose power of some sort. So he was more authoritarian than usual. And the sanctions were hitting stronger on Iraq more and more to the way that Iraqi economy was destroyed, almost destroyed. So it was kind of a relief. I mean, what is there to lose really kind of attitude is that, mm -hmm. well, maybe these guys are going to make it better. And my parents, even though did not publicly were, were, were opposed to Saddam Hussein, but they were not a fan. They were not fans. I mean, because that both of them were educated and, and they wanted, they had a lot of skills that they can contribute to make the country a better place. And he kept going from a war to a war, destroying the Iraqi economy, slash destroying Iraq in general, killing tons of, of people, hundreds of thousands of people. Not were the, when the sanctions were happening before the war, were there people that basically were like, if he would just change his tune, if he would stop doing certain things, and then America would ease up on the or the international community would ease up on the sanctions and things would actually get better. Like, like he sort of made his bed is what he, I'm saying, right? Yeah, I mean, it depends who you ask. I mean, if you ask the Kurds, they will tell you like he gassed he, us he gassed multiple them. times. I mean, there's no, there's no negotiation here. If you, if you ask some people who are having a relatively safer life and also we didn't know what the, what the alternative was. I mean, now many people say, oh, we wish Saddam is back or Saddam used to be safe. But at the time, many people didn't know that Iraq would, would erupt in such chaos. So, so, so every thinking happens in comparison, is that oh, if it was better back then, or it was better uh, or worse before. So yeah, it depends who you ask. I mean, there are people, if you go to the southern part of Iraq, which there was kind of a semi-Arab spring happened in 1991 after the first Gulf War, the usual houses you see pictures of dead children, dead sons, and and uh, I, I think these guys have a different perspective whether they want Saddam to stay or not. And, right. and if he stayed and he was old, uh, most likely his son would have been the president, which is Oday Saddam Hussein, who was far more. I mean, if you think Saddam is evil, this guy is evil on steroids. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, it's it's it's. Uh, I mean, I I struggle with these questions. I mean, I don't really have the best answer to them, but I think is that. It all depends what you value. If what you value, for example, what I value is, for example, freedom of information. Um, yes, Iraq is doing much better in terms of freedom of information. They have much more accessibility to information. So if you want to uh, democratize or move the society to become more accepting of enlightenment values or, or any values that you'd like to promote, Iraq is more suitable for it now than it used to in 2003. The same way Syria, I mean, Syria now is under Assad, is equivalent to what it used to be in terms of, of authoritarianism and information. So yes, it all depends what you value. If you value safety, Saddam Hussein's time were much safer. But how did he keep it safe? By putting people in the gulag, the equivalent of a gulag. I mean, right. that, I mean that's, uh, it's, it's authoritarian safety. It's not like safety as in everybody getting along, but it's more like if you speak your mind, you're gonna get killed. So of course you're gonna get safety. <laughs> so, <laughs> right. so, so, safe, so it's, it's um, But you get a lot of pushback when you say that sort of thing, right? When you say that, that Iraq now, even though Iraq is obviously still a mess and there was that brief moment, and I do wanna focus on it a little bit, that brief moment where there were free and fair elections, you know, basically free and fair yeah, elections, yeah, yeah. and the whole world saw it, but then the US under Obama just pulled out just like that, and then things got much worse. But at that little moment, 
when there were the elections, do you think more people were thinking like you just said? Because I see you say this sort of thing right now, yeah, that, yeah. that America has sort of freed Iraq in a lot of ways. And then I see the amount of hate that you get from, yeah. uh, usually, unfortunately, from the lefties. I mean, again, so, I mean, I'm, as I grow older, quote unquote, is that, I think is that even these fair elections, elections at the time were, were not necessarily the best idea because this is a country that was devastated by multiple wars. Mo many of the people are either sectarian or live in less education. So it, in a way, the, f the fair elections or the elections has enhanced sectarianism more than it reduced it because many of the people who are Shias, let's say, voted for Shia parties and Sunnis voted for Sunni parties and Kurds voted for the Kurds. But, and so as I, as I now think about it is that it's a democracy which I think that's where I think the Iraq war has failed miserably, is that democracy is not just about elections, it's about institutions, it's about civil liberties, it's about all of these uh, good education, good infrastructure. That was not, I mean, and that was not built, even though some may argue that was the intention of the war, but as you dig in more and you see the corruption between the contractors and the other contractors and suddenly just the money disappears for some reason, which was yeah. all meant for kind of rebuilding institutions. That is, I think, what was really missing. But because do you think, do, were we on the path until we left? Like, so you had the elections, I get what you're saying, yeah, it yeah. still could create a yeah, sectarian yeah. mess because everyone's just gonna vote for their own home parties, let's yeah, say. Yeah, yeah. But were we sort of on the path and then just magically left and then it I mean, the, the withdrawal was, I think even Democrats that I've talked to and who are supportive think it's a disaster. Is that, I mean, the, the, one of the things that the U.S., I mean, I, I, I was at the, at the time in Iraq as well, is that the U.S. was doing with, with, with there's a movement called the Awakening Forces, which are Sunni militias fighting against Al-Qaeda. It was kind of acting as a neutral force between all of these, because the Shias don't see the Americans as Shias or Sunnis, they see them as Americans, mm -hmm. so, or vice versa. Yeah, right. So the tribes, for example, were willing more, the Sunni tribes were more willing to work with Americans than they were willing to the, work with the Iraqi, with the Iraqi Shias, because they think the Iraqi Shias are affiliated with Iran, which is their internal enemy. So in a way, America was acting as a kind of a neutral force that keeps all of these people together. And the moment that disappeared, which is from the withdrawal, which was amazingly unplanned, the Iraqi government, which was sectarian at the time, and, and in a way still is, immediately pulled out the funding from all of the Sunnis that were fighting against Al-Qaeda. So, right. so, so when that happened, immediately th these guys who were fighting against Al-Qaeda started either becoming a target to, to still the sleeping cell, sleeper cells of, of the terrorist group, or um, they were like, okay, what, what are we gonna fight for anymore? So then suddenly ISIS comes up. What a surprise. So, so, so for those who actually followed Iraq from all of the beginning to the end, the ISIS evolution makes absolute sense. Right, and there's probably um, a, a parable here to, in a way, what's happening right now with Turkey and the Kurds that we were there. Yeah, yeah. Maybe we shouldn't have been there. You can make all those arguments, yeah, yeah, yeah. but we were there and now we moved these troops and now Turkey's just slaughtering these Kurds, and it's like, all right, so maybe if we did try to go for good reasons, you know, like yeah, yeah. putting that debate aside, yeah, yeah. we were there, we know that the Kurds were basically our allies there, and now we've left just like we sort of left there. And yeah, and, and now the Kurds won, won America's bank to, def to defend them from all of the other factions. And is that, that our responsibility, and all, all of the, those are I mean, I do think, questions to yeah, discuss. I do think uh, it is, I mean, I think people on, uh, let's, let's call it the liberal world, uh, for, uh, is that, that you, we have to have to f support our, our fellow liberals, or people at least adhere to some, I mean, in Kurdish factions, there's communists and there are other yeah. factions that, that when, are there. When you say liberal, just to clean it up, so you mean, do you mean just basic Western ideas like, like of freedom? People who yeah, support freedom in, in general yeah. and, and adhere to women's quality and all of that. Yeah. So um, uh, there is a funny quote that, that's from, from a, a, a Lebanese poet, he said, Sunnis have Saudi Arabia, Shias have Iran, but secularists have nobody but God. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, exactly. So, so yeah. in a way is that if, if we do not support those who adhere to these values, at least some of them by comparison to the others, I'm not sure that the YPJ and others adhere to Western values or Enlightenment values, but they are much better than the, some of the other factions. I mean, it's all by comparison. So if we're gonna left these guys to be slaughtered, then who do we have left to support? Yeah. I mean, that, that is one of the, is that we need people 
on the ground. Which is, which well, is the that, libertarian, which is, the purely libertarian argument would be just get the hell out, let them do it, and that's that. I always say uh, is 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 that the Middle East is the opposite of Las Vegas. What happens in the Middle East doesn't stay in the Middle East. Yeah. So you cannot leave this region alone. It, it's for, I mean, I just came back from Europe and I see a lot of the refugees coming from Syria and, and, and other war zones. And this is an area that is the central, it's called the Middle East. It's in the middle of the world. Mm -hmm. And it is the birthplace of all the monotheistic religions. And its influence on, I mean, it's also one of the richest parts of the world because of oil and natural gas and and we cannot be be le left alone uh, and, and I mean the the terrorists are the extremists are not the ones leaving us alone so mm -hmm. the thing is that if you say I'm gonna leave them alone it is on the premise that there is kind of an agreement a mutually assured destruction here but there mm -hmm. is not I mean when you have a guy who wants to establish a caliphate and you're like no it's not my business this is a bad deal right but so because the extremists are expansionists. The extremists are not going to be happy. I mean, even ISIS, they were not happy with just, even though they get a large territory, but they were not happy with just this territory. They were mm -hmm. willing to, to expand. I mean, and they have ads right. about they putting they the- They don't get to a border and be like, all right, we're good to go. I mean, we they, got. yeah, they they are anti, I mean, them and the libertarians <laughs> have a government in which like it's a word that is borderless. Is that this, they, they see that their ideology is borderless, which is, which is true according to their interpretation. So, so yeah, so, so I think is that leave them alone policy. Um, and also it's like, I mean, on, on what premise? I mean, America has intervened in the region. So it's just like you intervene and then you leave it in well, a situation that is much- break it, you fix it. Yeah, yeah, and, 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 yes, like I do. Yeah. And, and how to maintain all of that world order uh, with all of, if you're not gonna intervene, the Russians will, as yeah. it happened in Syria. And if you're not gonna intervene, the Turks will. And which world order you want to live in? J just very um, quickly on, on the Kurds. I mean, they basically yeah. have, the KRG basically has a state in Iraq. Yes, yeah, much. in a way autonomous. Would, yes. would you just before carving out that piece of Iraq officially and just letting them have that state? I understand that you still have the Syrian Kurds and the Turkish yeah, Kurds yeah. and the rest, but do you think as, as an Iraqi, do you think that that basically would just be fine? I mean, it, it sort of is. I, I mean, I, I think it it's all depends on what they want. Uh, I mean, there, there are arguments and, I, and, I, and I'm ha happily an ally of, of many Kurds, and there are arguments on, on, some argue that we have to stay as a part of Iraq, and some of them argue that they have to be autonomous, and there are, because there's a lot of natural resources that exist in Iraq that kind of, that they can rely on and benefit from, and also, if you're gonna form a state, you also might become vulnerable at least now Iraq is a state of, of some sort, so that if there is a Turkish invasion, it still be a Turkish invasion of Iraq in which where it's a state versus a, a Kurdish state that they will be vulnerable. So there really? is that true though? Would the would the Iraqi army defend? You think the if the KRG the area got attacked, you think the Iraqi army would step in? Yes, and maybe even the U.S. army, right? I mean, the U.S. embassy in Iraq is the largest embassy in the world. So so it's still there is a right, still, it's still part of the yeah country. yeah there's okay. still infrastructure that they can depend on. Um, so, I mean, I'm, I, I, maybe this is me and, and an extremist agree on it, but I am for unity. I mean, I, I'm, I'm, in, I'm in, I agree that there needs to be nation states and there needs to be, in a way, states that are based on ethnic groups because of, of, of the fact that they're being persecuted. But at the same time, it's, I mean, there are a lot of issues that the, that the world is now being more interconnected than ever. Mm -hmm. And we have to, so what happens in, in Iraq and what happens in other states, all, connect to each other. So I'm, I'm more in favor of more unity than, than division. Yeah. Uh, I, mean, I mean, we gotta create the division. Okay, the Kurds have their state. How about the Shias? Should they have their state? And should they be with Iran or should they be a separate state? Or how about the Sunnis? Should they be with Saudi Arabia? Like there's always gonna be- We think we're divided in America. That must be hilarious. Yeah, <laughs> yeah so, so who's, gonna, who's gonna be People representative? People are arguing about marginal tax rates and you're like, come on, this is not, <laughs> this is not sectarian. But real quick, I think we have to, Bizarrely, give Hillary Clinton a shout out here because I don't. You when did you move to America? Two thousand nine, right? Two thousand no, two thousand thirteen. Two thousand thirteen. Yeah, yeah, I left so, two thousand nine. Yeah. So during the campaign, the first Obama campaign, yeah, yeah, yeah. when they were in the primary, Hillary versus Obama. Um, I don't know if you saw this from the outside, but Hillary kept saying we have to leave Iraq, but we have to do it responsibly with the timeline and this whole thing. Yeah, yeah. And Obama kept saying, no, we've got to go, we've got to go. And that was in the midst of the hope and change thing and just everybody like just drinking the, the Kool-Aid and yeah, everything. Yeah, yeah. And then he did do it. And then as you're saying, it led to a lot of those things. So in a weird way, Hillary actually deserves some credit for, for being honest 
at least about what, what should have been done as opposed to just the rash decision yeah. to just get going. I mean, at the end of the day, which is, I hope we're gonna talk about modernization a bit, is that yeah. I think that at the end of the day, people in the Middle East have to fix their own region. I mean, I, I'm not in favor of interventionism forever or even interventionism in some cases. Is that at the end of the day, the people of the region have to choose their own destiny and that destiny should not be antagonistic to the world. And so, which brings up the need that we cannot rely, I mean, I, mean, I, think, I think now is more than ever and even previously, the United States is not a reliable partner. If you're fighting in the region, the United States might switch left to right and, and some people might use the interventionism as an argument for getting votes and some people might get to not gain votes. At the end of the day, you cannot rely on that. Mm -hmm. And it is in a way a weakness of the United States because as a democracy, you can have all these shifts. Well, for example, with Russia, I was having a call with, a, with actually a Syrian, uh, um, not militia, but he's a kind of an, an observer. And it was like, at least with the Russians, I know what's gonna happen in the next 10 years. Mm -hmm. With the Chinese, I know what's gonna happen in the next 15 years. But with the Americans, okay, we can have an interventionist president like Bush, for example, and then you can have Obama after that. And now I don't know what the shit show is, but, <laughs> but it, it's, it's- It's an interesting sort of soft spot it, of democracy. Yeah, it, is that, yeah. I mean, these, the, the problems in, in many of these issues, of extremism, authoritarian, these are need long-term solutions. I mean, even for example, which is kind of, we rely that as a basic of, of when people ask us about theory of change, is that in the Cold War, when the United States pushed for that communism was evil, and we had these values, and we have to spread them or defend them. That was a consistent policy in both Democrats and Republicans. Mm -hmm. Like you, see, you hear JFK talking about communism in the same way it, that Reagan was talking about communism, is that there was not this mm -hmm. split about who is the enemy and how can we fix it. It was consistent policy that we stand for these values as a state, and this value, which is communism, which is spreading, uh, spreading around the world, we have to put a stop into it, and this is a long-term solution. So if the Democrats want, if the Republicans want, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. Uh, and I think that if there is gonna be constant intervention or state solution to this, which I not necessarily believe in it, but because I'm, I'm more on the non-state intervention because I think that the states have, can, it, I mean, New York subway barely works, so, so forget about fixing the Middle East. <laughs> but, um, so I think is that- You just became a citizen and you're already <laughs> railing on, on our, on, on, I, ironically, the best subway system probably in the world, no, I mean, as terrible as it is, uh, no, it's, it's definitely, in that it runs 24 hours a day. It, it's great, yeah. uh, but, I, but I think is that this, this issue is back to our conversation, is that these issues need long-term solutions and this polarization of America, with left to right and all of that, is really harming our partners. So I think at the end of the day, which I'm setting up as my organization and, and, and other allies and partners, we have to empower the people there in the region to be self-sufficient. Yeah. At the end of the day, the goal is self-sufficiency for the people who hold our values and, and, and for them to fight for, yeah. for themselves and fight for others. Well, that's why I brought up the Hillary thing, because it's interesting, we just have to think about these things seriously to whatever extent we're gonna think about them, because just saying, okay, something bad's happening, we're just getting the hell out of there and just because we, it makes us feel good yeah, yeah, yeah. isn't necessarily the wise thing. It doesn't mean that staying is the right thing, but at least be willing to think about some of these things. And I, th I think there is a- there Or is at a, least talk about them honestly. Uh, one of the ma amazing quotes, which I, which I always remember from David Petraeus, who was at the, head, the, at the time the head of the multi-coalition forces in Iraq, he said the only time we were actually able to defeat terrorism in Iraq, which actually he did in some parts, and which when we cared about the citizens of Iraq as much as we cared about the citizens of the United States. Hmm. So any policy that is, I mean, in a way is that being compassionate is actually a winning policy against, because if you, uh, I mean, as in, in case of, of, of when I, I give talks and stuff, if the conversation is always about, okay, how is that gonna benefit the United States? Not to say that this should not be a policy if you work at the State Department, but I think is that the, the best policy is a policy that looks at that target audience or the people there, and we're like, okay, we care about your safety as well. Not, okay, you guys kill each other and we're gonna sit on basis <laughs> and, and at least protect, protect our, ourselves. I think there should be and, and it has been applied before, which actually, I mean, with the, with the Petraeus situation, he worked with a lot of Sunni allies, it's called the Awakening Forces at the time, in which they actually were able to defeat Al-Qaeda 
step by step. They were they, they formed this when they saw that okay, well, the Americans actually care about us. They they they, they they're not just opportunists who 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 would throw us under the bus, right. but rather care about our lives as much as they care about their army's lives. And when that happened, actually, there was a defeat. For Al Qaeda, and were, that's basically like when the surge was happening. Yes, much, yes, right? so, yeah, yeah. So that was yes. So the surge was complementary to this to these uh, Sunni allies who were fighting. So I think that is the best policy. Mm -hmm. It's not okay. Um, oh, the, this got cost too much for us, or this. It should not be looked at it in this way. It should be that if we're going to defeat terrorism, we have to side with allies there and give them our word and actually stick with it, not flip around. So I want to switch sort of to you coming to America and everything you've done since then. Yes. Um, but I thought an interesting transition to all this would be, you probably saw it just in the last couple of weeks, Ellen DeGeneres had to go on her show and basically sort of apologize for sitting in a box at a football game with George W. Bush and because everybody was saying George W. Bush is a mass murderer and got us into Iraq and all oh, of those yeah. things. And I thought that's kind of consistent <laughs> with a lot of the pushback that say I get on some of yeah, these yeah, things yeah. or the, but but really let's make this about you you are the guest <laughs> uh, when you come to America yeah, yeah, and yeah. talk about uh, some of these issues I know for you it's been really bizarre to find out who the people that kind of hate you are and, and yeah. where where your allies come from can you talk about that a little bit <laughs> it's, it's uh, I mean on, on that note because you're uh, another kind of apostate you're not just a religious apostate um, I suppose I, it's actually really interesting. I, after um, so I had a walk experience, uh, which I think we're worth <laughs> sharing. Um, I've decided uh, almost like 52 months ago or 50 days ago that I'm not going to read the news. I'm actually I'm only going to focus on my work and how. And if there's any news that is relevant to my work, I will get it from my staff. <laughs> <laughs> Honestly, so I, I, I've done, I've had a policy, which, which is sometimes inconsistent because I've been following the, a lot of what happened with the Kurds and everything. But I was like, if that is something I am, number one, not my expertise. Number two, uh, incapable of changing. Why am I bothering myself? Because all I'm getting is getting complete you agitation. You mean you don't want to tweet about it? All day? What, what, what are you doing? <laughs> uh, 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 okay, so putting aside the yeah, Ellen thing, yeah, yeah, but yeah. The, the you know what I'm talking about with the, the general philosophy. Yeah, you yeah, come yeah. to America, yeah. you're, you're a brown-skinned immigrant. Yeah. You come here, you, you really start getting success and friends yeah, and, yeah, yeah. and all of these things, and you're talking about these issues. When was the first moment that you realized, whoa, the people that are supposed to be supporting me here in America are not, and the ones that I thought were gonna hate me uh, suddenly support me, if that's a fair way of starting this it, it's, question. It's really interesting. I mean, that, that has been an ongoing um, discussion internally, not to sound like, like a crazy person, but... <laughs> well, you've had it externally, too, because yeah. we, we've been talking about uh, this for years. Yeah, yeah, I mean, yeah. you, you were actually one of the first people, the first time you were on my show, yeah. um, was one of the first times that I really fully understood it from another perspective. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I was seeing it from my own perspective, oh, of the lefties kind of abandoning yeah, liberalism, yeah, yeah. But, but seeing, I mean, truly, just because of your identity in a way and where you come yeah, from, yeah, yeah. I was like, oh, this one's just really obvious now. And now it's, everyone sees this. I mean, the, the best example, I think, I think it's an article t you tweeted about w what happened in the University of Rochester. Mm -hmm. and, and I was right. talking about the, the need for, for ideas being borders and everything, and then there was, I think some, she had like a Marxist uh, thing on her back, and they were amazingly disruptive. And then she, um, I mean, she was shouting at me and she was insulting and all of that. And she was accusing me of, oh, and there's other one in, in, in Portland State University in which I was accused of spreading white supremacy. Yeah, well, they <laughs> uh, called me a homophobe and Christina Huff Summers a, a, a anti-feminist. Yeah, so, yeah so. so that, it is, it is actually one of the, most the strangest things uh, I mean I, and I'm I've, I've seen it in Europe as well is this unholy alliance that between the far left and 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 the Islamists in a way the the, the it's funny in Iraqi elections the last Iraqi elections the communists and the Islamists were in the same coalition party <laughs> uh, which is really interesting because I think is that there is a correlation of the ideology between those who are far leftists and Islamists that they really hate the same people which is, in a way, the capitalistic uh, or neoliberalism, whatever they want to call but, it. But is the, real, I, is the real cohesion there just because they both want state power? 
right? Like they, they want it for different reasons, but it's almost like, like here the way I would view it is the reason, yeah. that, the reason that the Islamists love the progressives is because the progressives are trying to attain state power and then the progressives will just sort of be the last ones to be beheaded. I mean that, I mean that kind of metaphorically and literally, but do you think that's like a fair estimation? Because it's both about accumulating power, maybe I, for different reasons. I think you're putting too much thinking into it. <laughs> I right. think is that the people, like the, at least the ones that I have talked to who are with sympathize with Islam, really don't have any fucking idea what they what they talk about. They they know they know what they hate. And, and most you're talking about the Islamists. No, no, the, 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 the far leftists. Yes, yeah. is that they know what they hate, yeah. right? And they know as they go with this more ideologies come in of of of, of intersectionality or all of that. So they know what the enemy is. So yeah. in a way, well, I agree with that. I agree that, that most they, of them don't know what they're doing. They they would so. Okay, this fits the identity politics that we want to fulfill. Um, and and I've, I've talked about this, I think, on your show, about the zoo theory in which they want a rainbow and, oh, here is a panda and here is a... So they want this diversity. So they put the hijabi in yeah. because she looks authentic. So in a way, <laughs> they're committing racism itself by putting uh, an act, uh, putting a, a religion or, in, in their ways, connected religion and ethnicity into like a certain look. So, so yeah, so that is, it is, I mean, Which it's is just, an unprogressive it, It's look. just absurd, it's just absurd, honestly. Yeah, uh, I but, mean, but do you- I mean, six years and a half in, I mean, I, I just don't know how to make any sense of it. So, so <laughs> it's just, uh, I mean, well, I, we, I, we, got, we got to keep going with this though, because though when they, yeah, see, yeah. When, when they see you by yeah, their yeah. rules, yeah, yeah. they should be all about you. They should, and some of them have. I mean, that, that's, I think that for me to have, at least from an organizational perspective, you should donate. <laughs> you know, <laughs> I think is that people. We'll, we'll talk about it. No, no, but but the thing, thing is yeah. that I look at. I mean, I I d need allies, but at the same time, I need supporters, which mm -hmm. I think is a bit different. And I've mysteriously, uh, which is something that I would like to to try to but one day. Is that other, I think is that that university world, and I'm actually I'm cutting a lot of my speaking engagements in universities for that reason and also the social media is really, I mean, I think your bio says tw Twitter is not real world, right? Yeah. Is that- Twitter is not real life. Many, many Americans are really nice people. Yeah. Like, I mean, I, have, I can say that with, with, uh, with certainty now, as, as I've been now to 40 states, and uh, I've lived, actually I was hosted by a family who is gun lovers, uh, who are, she's Mexican, Chinese, married to a Native American and African American, and they love, uh, they love me, and they were like semi-conservative and semi-liberal, and hosted me in their house for a year, and I still call them my American family. And I get to know, and these are not the people you see on, in college campuses or you see on Twitter, right? Yeah. They, these are, they can be progressive on some others and on some things and, and conservative in others, and they have been, th this type of mix, it's called, not the ideologues of both sides, this kind of mix have been our biggest allies for the organization, and for me, and as an individual, but also as an organization. So I think is that, that's, I think there was also a study done on Twitter, is that how, that, that those who actually are on Twitter, those crazy maniacs, it's kind of a self-selection, mm -hmm. is that this is, we, we th like even, even I had a lot of prejudices against the right when I moved to the United States. That, and, that's exactly what I was and, and, for, and when I, and obviously hearing the, 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 the left wing or, or that, that section, the talk show host, and they have made a boogeyman of, of, of these people. And other than the, the actual boogeyman and those who are also talk show hosts of the right wing establishment, but most people who are conservative are also very nice people, you know? So I think is that that is, the problem is that how can we give these guys a platform? <laughs> uh, which I think you're you are doing uh, uh, some of us. Some of, I think is that... Wait, who, who do you mean these guys? Th those who are actually sane people, oh, who are I'm not fighting with... I'm trying, man. Yeah, who are not like <laughs> s starting at Dave Rubin oh, or like at Faisal. Like, you know, th these are... Um, unfortunately, they are very the loudest in, in, in most of the... But 
if you, I mean, that, I'm now realizing it after I, I said I quit the news and even social media, I only post selfies of me eating shawarma. Yeah. <laughs> but but um, I think is that as I go outside and I, I now, yeah, many people are actually really nice. It, it's interesting um, because, you know, I traveled the, the country yeah. and, and the world actually, about 20 countries over the course yeah, of yeah. last year on tour with Jordan. And that also, my main takeaway was that. that yeah, yeah. That, that especially, it is particularly unique here in the United States. Yeah. How great everyone is. Like, it's you, amazing. You, okay, so now as a citizen here, yeah. and someone that's been here for six plus years. Yeah, probably so. How often do you uh, face hate and face racism? Let's say from the quarters that they would tell you you're supposed to be getting it from. Are the Trump supporters hunting you down? I mean, th thank goodness, not, not that I know of. <laughs> but no, I mean, I mean, I think. But I mean, we go out all the time yeah, in New York, yeah, yeah. and you make all sorts of funny Arabic jokes yeah, to the yeah. waiters and waitresses. You're, by the way, the only person I know that when you sit down at a restaurant, you order two drinks at once. <laughs> I get a glass of red wine. You get a beer and a margarita. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because, because I know I'm going to order them, so might as well <laughs> get them together. So in that but way, then the margarita just starts melting. I know. I'm trying to explain this. I, to you. My physics knowledge is very limited right. but uh, yeah I, 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 I mean but really do you face any ra any racism that not, you know of in America any anti-immigrant so, so some so yes and yes and no um, when the trouble I mean you thank you invited me to be on your show when the travel ban yeah. happened and yeah. my mom was in Iraq when that so that thing affected actually me personally yeah. um, Overall, I mean, yes, I, I think it being any public figure of any sort, um, you get hate as part of the game, but it's much significantly less. I mean, but I, I mean, I mean there's no way comparison, like, like, I mean, maybe my standards are low. I don't mean low. hate, though. I mean, yeah, yeah. I don't mean hate like, oh, I don't like his policy, I don't yeah, like yeah, him, yeah. something like that. I mean that you are a brown immigrant in the United States. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But, no, I mean, I, overall, I would say, yeah, I mean, by any comparison, like, compared to, living in the Middle East to, to, to here is in no way, I mean, not even, I mean, I mean, I, I think, think that there, there, obviously some people have different definitions, but I think, is it dehabilitating to my life? No. I'm having, I think my most account is a good life. Yeah. I love living in America. I love my friends here. I, I, I think that I now have, have a strong bond to this country as a country who accepted me from the environment that I still live in and really gave me that, I think, the American dream. I mean, I think I'm, I'm a symbol of it in a way. That I, well, I, that's why I love um, seeing your posts. I love yeah, seeing you on Instagram and you, you know, when you just posted all the stuff from the party that you had when you, uh, when you officially yeah, yeah, yeah. you got the big American hat on, the American dream. Yeah, yeah. And it's like, you are the American dream to me. I, I really believe that. And right? the people who attended that party, by the way, I had, I had a party to be a U.S. citizen. And the people who came for party are from every faction yeah. of, of either humanity or political views. And... No, I, I think I think is that th those who can always look for fights will find them, <laughs> as in any case. Yeah. But I think is that, and obviously everyone's experience is different. I mean, I, I don't live in I don't know a small town, or I don't live in the Bronx. You know, there's there. I think th these people might have different experiences that I do. But I think I mean I would be dishonest to play this identity politics. So I'm a victim here, and I think... Yeah. Like, I've done events with you in Texas, yeah. and then we've gone to local bars yeah, that yeah. are redneck bars. I remember that yeah, night, yeah, I forgot yeah. what town we were in. But we went to that, yeah, well, yeah. You would, the average person would think is some middle America redneck bar. Yeah, and yeah. we had a great freaking time, and nobody cared, and, and yeah, you're yeah. loud, right? You're always loud and laughing, <laughs> and nobody cares. No, no, yeah, I think I think this, these are uh, a lot of uh, po polarizing misconceptions that need to be fought. I mean, I, I, I mean, my parents live in Texas, by the way. All my exes live in Texas. <laughs> but, <laughs> actually, they don't. They live in California. Yeah. But, but I, no, I mean, my, my parents live in Texas. I go to many, I go to Texas quite a lot. Yeah, I mean, this, the, this misconception that people there are a bunch of racist and, and um, I mean, I've also been to like small town. There's an area called Fritterisburg, Texas, which is, has kind of German wineries and beers and stuff. And many people there were like Texans, and, and they were not antagonistic whatsoever. They were like actually very friendly. Yeah. Um, can, can you so, talk a little bit about because you've been traveling a lot lately? Yeah. And I know you were in Europe just yeah. these last couple of days, actually. Um, how the sort of integration thing or race conversation or the rest of it, how that's different here than it is in Europe it's, from what you're finding? I, I mean, my if there is one word to describe it, it's tense, man. 
<laughs> it stands. Uh, I mean, I'm so the, you were in Denmark, you were yes, in the UK. I was in Denmark mostly. Yeah. I was in Denmark for like seven, eight days, and then I went to Norway and I went to the UK. Um, the the thing is like, and also I've, I've been to Germany and the UK, and, and so I'm using my American passport. Yeah, jeez. Uh, yeah. yeah, actually, I, I, I just a, a lot of it, like when I get the passport, I was like, let me go to Canada to the AB test it. Does this really work? And I went to Montreal. I was like. Oh, this shit actually works, and I was like, okay, I can go to Europe now. Oh, and that's then, hilarious! You just wanted to test it out in Canada because <laughs> that's a little yeah, easier because it's the closest, the closest yeah. country. I love it. Uh, you, you get, you become an American citizen. You get a sharp leather jacket, and you immediately go to Europe. <laughs> <laughs> that's beautiful. Uh, living it, yeah. yeah. Um, I think is that, I mean, obviously, I think the main difference between the United States and and Europe is that everybody can be American. America is a land of immigrants. At the core of it is that the identity is attached to values. I mean, when I became a U.S. citizen, it was, uh, I mean, the test is, is, is easy, but it's like, okay, what, what does the United States, what are the Bill of Rights, freedom of speech, all of that. You mean the, you didn't have to pledge allegiance to white power? No, no, that, no, that was not, not this test? time, no. Oh, okay. <laughs> but, but they said, come back in five years. Yeah. But uh, <laughs> um, I think is that, so, so, that mixture of like that this is a state based upon values. I mean, that's one of the reasons. I mean, I was actually had possibilities. I mean, I was rejected for entering the United Kingdom, but I had possibilities of entering different states in Europe to emigrate, even though I was in that tough situation in which I would take it regardless where it comes. I, if I had the choice, I would choose America, and I would still choose it again. Is that this is a land that is based on values. And so as a result, See, you and I uh, having a conversation. We've, we've had a margarita together in yeah. multiple states. And, <laughs> and I, I think, yes, while this can happen in different European states, which is that Europe has a, Europe in a way like Asia is part of the old world. And there is history and there are conflicts there that if you are an immigrant, it is used. I mean, when I was in Denmark, it was obvious I was a foreigner. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it was obvious I was a foreigner because Denmark has a king and has a history and has, in a way, specific tribe that eventually became a state, as in the case of, yeah. of, of many. So, Although they are struggling a little bit less with the immigration issue than the other Scandinavian countries, right? At least that was my take when I was I'm, in Denmark. I mean, it depends who you ask. Some people, I mean, now I think the male of the social democrats are, are, are getting tough on immigration to, to protect the welfare state and, huh. and so that. So, so I, as a result, is like so. So you have this kind of. N I would say the threshold to integrate is more difficult than America. I think I think America is easy to integrate to. I think many people there is a it's a mel melting pot. It's um, I mean, some guys like oh you're, oh you're not American enough. Well, like I was like I drink Bud Light, isn't? It? <laughs> but but no, it's like no, this, did someone really ever say yeah, that? Yeah yeah. So, so, and actually the, that would get to the, my question. The, the guy was the guy from England. <laughs> The guy who's from England? Yeah, who was telling me what, what I was, right, what, what I was showing him. Well, uh, he's like, oh, no, you're not American. I was like, oh, like uh, I don't have time for you. But um, So I think is that the threshold to enter American society or to integrate America uh, is different. I think so there it's more difficult to integrate. By default, it's more difficult to integrate. Imagine you are from Aleppo and you grew up in a religious Muslim background in which you were taught that the West is, is an enemy or your values are more superior to their values. Clash immediately happens. Mm -hmm. is, is that like, it's, it's already, I mean, the Poles are difficult to integrate in Denmark. Leave aside somebody from Raqqa or, yeah. or, 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 or a small town Syria. Like, mm -hmm. so, and so as a result, it is, so you have this states with, to some extent, a strong identity that is tied to the history and tied to, to, to in some extent, ethnic identity, which is not I'm, a, not I'm a fan of, but these are, it's a different history. And then it is not easy to, even if you are like, let's say, even if you are the secular open-minded, you might also be viewed differently. And imagine if you're not secular open-minded, mm -hmm. <laughs> so mm -hmm. now you're going minus 50 on, on level of integration. And, and, and if you want to, not only that, you want to abuse their system, or, or, or then the clash expands. So, so in a way, is that some of the bad immigrants who moved there have 
just like in any case of extremism, is that they also ignited the far right. So now the far right, and, and so now there's like uh, 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 this huge tension between the far right in Europe and then the Islamists who are getting more and more organized. Mm -hmm. And uh, unfortunately, the victims of that are the good immigrants yeah. who really have nothing to do with all of that bullshit. Which of course is most uh, which is um, Which is, yeah, and, and I mean, I've talked to some of them who really love, really love living in Europe and, 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 and uh, I mean, it's, it's, it's a privilege. I mean, in, to, to live in a society that, that gives you rights and, 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 and com it's, it's, it's a privilege. I mean, not everybody, most people in the world still live in authoritarian states. I mean, it's, it's a privilege to live in liberal democracies. Are, and, are you shocked that so many people in the West, or let's just take it from an American yeah, perspective yeah. now that you're an American, are you, so, are you shocked that so many Americans are just afraid to say what you're saying right now? Like, even before, you just you repeatedly said values. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I know pretty much that all 12 of those Democratic candidates yeah, yeah. would be scared to say something like, I believe in a American values because the implication is somehow that means something racist now, right? So the only people you have talking about values are yeah, either yeah, conservatives yeah. or say the, the that, more fringe far right people. That's who, what I was talking about. Yeah, 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 yeah. That's what I was talking about. Is, is that they talk about values, but they talk about values all directed to, in a way, conservative Christians or, or kind of uh, or far right, and, and, and even though these are separate categories. But but yeah, it's. And that's but where we, cultural but the point relativism is that we should talk about. Yeah, values, yeah that, right? that's where cultural relativism is is very cancerous yeah. because it's that that I mean, uh, which is again back to the accusations that I get is that oh I'm trying to uh, westernize uh, the the Arabs or something like that and it was like when John Stewart Mill wrote because we translated a lot of Mill's yeah, work. Yeah, so and we're going to get to that. Is that John Stewart Mill when he said freedom of speech? He didn't say freedom of speech for white for, people or people in. In England, he said, "Freedom of speech is a universal human right that should be applied everywhere." And the fact that that people from there are protesting in the streets now in Baghdad and in, in Syria and all the, are demanding these rights, what it, it, to to deny them these rights in the name of cultural relativism is racism, is and, racism. Har and harmful. Uh, so it's a mix of both. It's dangerous and racist. So yeah. so so saying that. And, and what I, what I find it also interesting is that cultural relativism. I don't want to go too philosophical. Is itself self-destructive because if you if cultural relativism is everything is relative, then this is an objective statement. So by the way, <laughs> by the now way, you're going Yoda deep. Yeah, yeah, but yeah. by the by get the, rid of that pillow. You want yeah. that pillow back? Uh, sure. Um, by the fact that you are saying everything is relative, you are making an objective statement. So in a way, it's, it's a so so as an and result, it's also everyone knows it's not true. Not everything is equal. Not every some not, countries throw gays off roofs. Some don't. That's not equal. Yeah, not 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 in values, of course. Uh, and the thing is, like we 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 know now we know better. I mean, that's one of the things that that I mean. You have interviewed Steven Pinker on your show, mm -hmm. and Steven Pinker have written this amazing book. I mean, I call yeah. him the Ayatollah of ideas yeah. beyond borders. <laughs> <laughs> and, and Steven Pinker wrote this book on Enlightenment Now, which is which is there it is and right there. It's, and we we have happily translated it. And the thing is. It talks about that these are the values, there are a lot of manners, of how they made the world better everywhere they were applied. So it's really, identity politics and, and, and it's, it's irrelevant here, is that when you have societies that have better women's rights, have better equality, have better freedom, they become better. That is an objective, and, and he has a, a full freaking book with data. Yeah. So, so what is the argument? So that's the thing with, 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 with is that, they don't have an argument against that. They don't have an argument that if you allow women rights and, LGBT and minority rights, individual rights to flourish in these countries, these countries become, they don't have an argument against that. So what they do is that they shift the argument into, oh, you are, you are white supremacists or, or westernizing. And I was like, no, the people from there want it. You, you think that people from there don't want to right. it would adhere only, to these values? It would only make sense if you didn't think that Western values and Enlightenment values were good, but, yes. they, but they are universally good, as, exactly. as you just said. Yeah. And, 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 and there are Arab states, for example, Tunisia, when they have applied women's rights, they became better states. So, so that is, it's, that's why I was saying that it's both racist and dangerous, because you're denying people there who you know that the values are good, and you know that they work, but you deny them because you, in the name of, of whatever ideology you want to justify. So I think is that, that's why I think, I mean, those who, there, there are two sides that actually attacks us. 
uh, and both of them are racist, in my, in my opinion. The first one is the cultural relativist, which is, oh, these are our values, who are we to tell them? And then the other one will be like, oh, these values are only attached to the white race, and these other brown people cannot adhere to them. Yeah. So, is that, that and, and so a way, that in a way, voice, both, though, huh? So that voice, though, so I, get, I think we yeah, all understand, yeah. everyone watching this understands the first version, yeah, of that, yeah. I think, because it's what we talk yeah. about all the time. That other version, though, who, who is that? I, I, th I mean, I mean, is that just like an online voice? Because I don't see that. Not, that necessarily, voice. not necessarily. I yeah. mean, I've had, I've had uh, some conversations with a lot of, I mean, political parties in Europe, who, in a way, play on this. So, so, so that's interesting to me. Do you, yeah, yeah. you think it's a more of a European? I mean, uh, yes. I, I mean, I need to spend more time talking with American politicians, but yeah. I think, I think in America it's probably much less. Yeah. Um, is that? I mean, that's why I'm very worried of not using the term Western values, because when somebody attaches a, a, a value system into a region, it becomes, it, it, okay. it gets complicated, yeah. right? So when some people say um, Western values, they all, uh, some of these faction of these people mean that only Westerners adhere to these values, or only Westerners can yeah. adhere to these values. So it's, it's sometimes very important to actually differentiate. I mean, I, I don't think people who say Western values are racist, but I think is that th there are factions within those who will, which is in a way the same as the cultural relativism. It's actually no different whatsoever. Right. It is, that, it this, is cultural relativism. <laughs> it, it, it is cultural yeah. relativism. So, so it, it's not, um, nothing, I mean, I, I mean on, on a personal, also organizational level, I mean, we have not been attacked by any prominent figure within the people who advocate that in our organization. So that's, that's good. Uh, but I think, I, I mean, I've, I've had some conversations with, with some parties, and some were Swedish and some were, and who are like, uh, and, and th they kept saying that, in a way, again, similar to cultural relativism, is that you are acting Western and you're acting white. <laughs> because, like, you, because you want people to be free. Yes. Basically. So, 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 in a way, there is. I mean, kind of the horseshoe theory. In a way, is like they are really similar. Yeah. In, in the way. Uh, well, I'm glad you clarified the yeah. difference between from an American and European yeah, perspective. Because yeah, yeah. from an American perspective, yes, there are little fringe voices on the internet that I see saying yeah, things yeah, yeah. like that, but no real institutional power or anything. Yeah, not, 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 not that I know of. Yeah. I mean, if I, if I find someone, I will tweet at them. <laughs> Please do. All right. Uh, so, wait. We have to finish up by talking specifically about ideas beyond yes, borders. Which, and you mentioned John Stuart Mill. You know, I've got a copy of On Liberty on my nightstand. You can go, it, it, you can go my sign favorites, it later. Yeah. Uh, can you write something in Arabic on it? That would uh, actually be pretty great. I can do it, of course. Okay, yeah, so yeah, I'm going to have you do that after show. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to put God is great. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. But, um, um, no, talk to me about exactly what Ideas Beyond Borders is doing, because you guys have translated tons Yes. Now. How many books? 3,100 3, articles as of now and 12 books. Amazing. And um, so just what, where did this idea really come from and what are you guys doing? Uh, the, so the first, uh, actually it's very relevant to a lot of conversations, that the first that, that we uh, depend a lot of our organization about is that from the United Nations Development Report for the Arab world, it says that there are more books translated to Spanish in one year than Arabic in 1,000 years. And also, only 0.6% of internet content is in Arabic, even though it's a language spoken by 400 plus million people. As I was growing up in, 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 in Iraq, thank goodness I was bilingual. I was, I was taught English since a very young age. And as a result, I was able to access the alternative voice, in that case, the liberal uh, voice. If you, are, if you are an Arab young man growing up in Iraq, and you, uh, not in Iraq, but all over, and if you search about basic stuff, about human rights, freedom of religion, all of that, the, the two main things you get are either from authoritarian state or extremists. Even though many people are hooked to the internet, mm -hmm. but really the information that they are getting... Yeah, it just hits a wall. It's, it's really from, I mean, in, in the bad guys, right? The, the, those who want to advance. So I, as somebody who grew up there and, and, and I, and now having the privilege of, of, of being safe, number one, and being able to connect to people like you and be on media and connect, is that IBB is becoming a platform to help people in the region who adhere to our values to translate and distribute the materials that make the world a better place, which are enlightenment values. So we started with um, a small office and then I start pitching the idea around to young Arabs, not to Westerners, but to young Arabs. Is that something we want? 
Yes, is the answer is yes. And then we formed a team. I mean, now we're expanding to 120 translators all across the region, demanding and translating this content about enlightenment to be translated and viewed by Arab youth. And so the, 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 to, the connect to all of that is that living in the Iraq war and, and seeing all of these things is that this war on terror or bombing of terrorists only deal with the tip of the iceberg. We kill the Bin Ladens and we kill the ISISs, but that doesn't deal with the root of the problem, which is values. Extremist values are, are bring destruction and enlightenment values bring hope and, and, and prosperity. It's clear, it's, it's factual. And these values need to be, those who adhere to them need to be supported and these values need to be spread to counter extremist narrative and even replace it in the future. So that is kind of the gist of ideas being born. Is to provide, is to, to prevent extreme, the mission of our organization is preventing extremism before it takes root. So in that way, if you change the ecosystem of information, which they get the Steven Pinkers and the John Stewart Mills, and they read them, and then when an extremist guy comes into them, and is like, hey, you want to establish a caliphate and all of that, the answer will be no. And not only, to be recruited to a terrorist organization, but to re reject all of that ideology, which is the Islamist ideology, which is of, of, of having an uh, authoritarian state built on, on religion or uh, other authoritarians like, like, like the rest. So we've actually had a tremendous, which actually brings us back to the concept of cultural relativism and stuff. Our content has been viewed 12 million times in Arabic. This is not, I'm not targeting students of Rochester, I'm targeting young <laughs> Arabs. And, and, and we have 4.5 million followers. So at the beginning, I was like, I was like, oh, maybe people will not read this content. It's too, the demand is there. Yeah. People want this, at least, I think some of it is relative to, to time, is that they have seen what Islamists look like. They live under them. For them, for me, Al-Qaeda is not just something I see on television. I lived under right. Al-Qaeda. I've seen... If you lived under Al-Qaeda, why not try an extremist like Stephen Pepper? You know, like <laughs> exactly. give it a shot, right? Uh, so, so, that, so they don't... The thing is, like, many of the young people don't need convincing, honestly, that these, the values of the extremists suck, but they need an alternative. And we are trying to provide that context and knowledge in which these people will be able to access it and now we are in the third phase in which we actually want to build a movement on the ground, which is back to the self-sufficiency argument, is that I want this movement that believes in enlightenment values to be everywhere, to run for mayoral elections, to be on television, to have a video blog. So, the, so that is the other angle, which is empowerment angle. We make the knowledge available, but also we empower those who adhere to these, to these ideas and let them lead the way. And we run surveys, which I love to share one day with uh, is that we're on surveys about, okay, what do you guys see to be translated? Enlightenment. That's what some of these people want to translate. Mm -hmm. They want to know books about freedom of speech, freedom of religion, um, all of this stuff that we value as... When my book comes out in April, don't burn this book, can we, can we translate it? Sure. Just yeah. talk to your agent because sometimes they're pain in the ass. Uh, don't worry about that. <laughs> uh, actually, I, I want to mention that because yeah. I, I think it is... is it's, we've had some difficulty. You're in the book, by the way. Oh, yeah? Yeah. Uh, as a what? Uh, as a shawarma? Uh, my shawarma dual delivery guy? You're my falafel guy. <laughs> <laughs> um, is that uh, we've had, so we're, I don't want to name and shame, but we've had some issues. So, for example, the author will be like, oh, please translate my book. I, will, I don't want money. It's, it's for the youth and all of yeah, that. I'll do it for free, obviously. Thank you, yeah. yeah. Then the agent, or it will be like, no, I want $10,000. And then we're like, we're a small nonprofit. What, what, where am I going to get the $10,000 from? So sometimes it's that, even because I think some translation rights are not owned by the author, they're owned by, by the, the publishing house. And as a result, we've had many authors who were trying to offer us their book, and then the conversation just ended with the agent. We're like, oh, if you don't give yeah. us 10,000, so, so. All right, we're, we're getting a little insider baseball here. No, but no, for, but, 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 but if but my agents won't do it, I'll pay whatever it is. So, okay, yeah. okay, thank you. Um, I, we could do this all day long. I know. We'll do this over dinner in a couple of days in uh, New York, um, but you really like, uh, doing this show, it's like I've met so many people I love and admire and that were heroes of mine and great authors and theater, but we've really become real friends outside I know. of this room, and, and you are exactly what the American dream is all about, and I'm just so thrilled that 
later maybe when I'm on the plane tonight, I'm gonna to go back and look at that first interview that we did and that the fact that you built this thing and you're successful and you're now a citizen, man, I, I mean, this is the same stuff I would say to you off camera, but really, I love it, I'm, I'm thrilled for you. And for you guys, uh, check out Ideas beyondborders.org. If you're looking for more honest and thoughtful conversations about international issues instead of nonstop yelling, check out our international playlist. And if you want to watch full interviews on a variety of topics, check out our full episode playlist. They're all right over here. And to get notified of all future videos, be sure to subscribe and click the notification bell.